Hi, good uh, afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me over the meeting as well. So uh, today's uh, topic we're discussing uh, is uh, spine symptomatology, examination, and localization. I'm assuming this uh, presentation will take about one hour to one and a half hours, and uh, should get over in that much time. And uh, let's uh, hope that all of you learn something uh, new from this presentation. Uh, the uh, presentation is designed that there are uh, five, uh, sorry, there are six uh, sections in this uh, presentation. And uh, after each section, we'll have a small break. And if any of you have any doubts, you can ask during that time. But in the middle of the section, please do not interrupt the uh, flow of the presentation. So uh, starting off this presentation, uh, we'll be covering one of the following six sections, the anatomy and uh, physiology of the spinal cord, the symptomatology of spinal disorders, examination for spinal diseases, localization of spinal disorders, formulation of a differential diagnosis, and practice. I'm requesting that everybody who wants to join next time, please join before 3.15 or whatever the designated time is for the meeting. Uh, coming to the first section of this uh, talk, we'll discuss a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of spinal cord so you can understand exactly how you have to uh, examine a patient as well as uh, localize diseases when it comes to clinical neurosurgery. So the first thing uh, you should know is exactly what is the uh, relationship of the spinal segment to the uh, vertebral segment. Uh, the cervical vertebrae, if you are looking at the cervical vertebrae in comparison to the cervical spinal cord, you have to add one level. So looking at upper thoracic vertebrae, on the other hand, like T1 to up till T6 level, you have to add two levels. If you're looking at lower thor thoracic vertebrae, then uh, for, uh, at the level of T7 to T9, you have to add three levels. Uh, if you're looking at the 10th thoracic vertebrae, uh, that incorporates L1 and L2 spinal levels. The 11th thoracic vertebra incorporates L3 and L4 spinal levels. The 12th thoracic vertebra involves the L5 spinal level. And the first lumbar vertebra contains all the sacral and coccygeal segments. Another important thing to know is what is the definition of the epiconus and the conus? The epiconus is located from the L4 to the S1 level, and it corresponds to the T12 vertebra. And the conus is located from the S2 to S5 level and corresponds to the L1 vertebra. Okay, uh, so a little bit about the gray matter and the white matter of the spinal cord. Uh, the uh, gray matter of the spinal cord, uh, for, let me talk about that. The, the first important thing to know is uh, that the gray matter is divided into the ventral and the dorsal horn. Right? And in certain areas of the spinal cord, you also have a lateral gray column. So in this uh, uh, important, uh, first, most importantly, we have to realize exactly where is the gray matter maximum. So there are two enlargements in the spinal cord. There is a cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement. The cervical enlargement extends from C5 to T1 and the lumbar enlargement from L1 to S3. This is important when we are drawing our localization diagrams. If you are drawing at these levels, you have to draw a significant amount of gray matter as compared to white matter. At all other levels, you should be drawing a much smaller amount of gray matter as compared to white matter. The important uh, localizing feature in this gray matter that will help you localize ex exactly where your lesion are. Uh, in the cervical region, when it comes to the anterior gray column, in the medial nuclei, these will supply the neck. The central nuclei between the medial and lateral nuclei, they will supply the accessory nerve from C1 to C5 level. And the phrenic nucleus, that is from C3 to C5 level. And the lateral ones will supply the upper limb. And that is the general scheme throughout the spinal cord. The uh, medial ones will supply the axial uh, musculature, and the lateral ones will supply the limb musculature. The posterior uh, gray column, on the other hand, uh, will have the general sensory nuclei. And in the cervical and the sacral cord, there is no nucleus dorsalis or Clark's column. Clark's column exists only from the C8 to L3, L4 level. The lateral gray column is present only in the thoracic and lumbar uh, spinal cord. That is from T1 to L2 level. It is not present anywhere beyond that. It is also not present in the S2 to S4 level. That is important to know that in sacral cord, we do not have a lateral gray column. The uh, parasympathetic outflow that is from S2 to S4 is actually located in the lateral part of the anterior gray column itself. So these uh, spe uh, special nuclei that uh, we have highlighted in the bold section will help you localize your lesion when it comes to the gray matter. The uh, second thing is, what about the white matter of the spinal cord? I understand that looking at this diagram is a little bit uh, difficult to understand, and it can be difficult to definitely retain this entire diagram. So uh, we'll uh, make this quite simple. Uh, first of all, uh, we'll just learn how to draw this diagram. So uh, whenever you're drawing a spinal cord, let's assume you're drawing a spinal cord at the cervical level of C5 or C6. OK, you can start just by drawing the gray matter first. Okay, and then you follow it up with your white matter. Okay. 
And whenever you have a diagram that you're drawing for the purpose of uh, your uh, clinical presentation, always label the diagram. So we know this is going to be dorsal. We know this is going to be ventral. And whichever side you're comfortable with this being right or this being left, that is your choice. Uh, then when it comes to, for example, if you're drawing at the C6 level, it's better to mention here that this is the C6 level. So we know, first of all, this is here if we have the gray matter. Okay. And then we have one, two, and three funiculi. So it is important to remember just there are three funiculi and you have to know what are the one special tract in each funiculus. That's all. Nothing of the previous thing that we saw. So in the first, that is the dorsal funiculus, we have the dorsal column. In the lateral funiculus, we have the corticospinal tract. And in the anterior funiculus, uh, the ventral funiculus, we have the spinothalamic tract. Okay. So these are the three most important tracks to remember. These are the only tracks which will help you actually in localization. None of the other tracks can actually help you in localizing a lesion. The other important thing is to know is how these tracks are arranged. So just it's one easy thing you can remember is that dorsal column is separate from the other two. Otherwise, both the corticospinal tract and your spinothalamic tract are going to be arranged in the same way. So we know that corticospinal tract is going to be supplying the gray matter over here. So where, if it is supplying the gray matter, the fibers should pass, preferably lie closer to the gray matter, right? So in the cervical cord, the cervical fibers should lie closer to the gray matter. So that is the easiest way to remember this. Okay, followed by thoracic, followed by lumbar, followed by sacral. And we know the spinothalamic tract will be similar. So it's cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And the dorsal column will be the exact opposite. Sacral, lumbar, thoracic, and cervical. This is all that you need to know for drawing a diagram for your clinical examination and localization, as well as just for general knowledge. We don't need to know any more than this as to where is your reticular spinal tract, all over spinal tract, et cetera, et cetera. Another important question that uh, sometimes you can be asked is where is the autonomic fibers located in relation to this uh, spinal cord? Uh, so does anybody know here? Where is it located? Where are the autonomic fibers in this spinal cord? If you're guessing, just raise your hand, please. Lateral gray column, You're, you mean here? OK. Uh, autonomic fibers are descending tracts, so they cannot be located in the gray matter. Any other guesses? OK, so uh, just right between the uh, dorsal, uh, col sorry, the ventral column over here and the uh, corticospinal tract over here, it is located right here. OK, so these are the autonomic fibers and their location. OK, uh, coming to the vascular supply of the spinal cord, it is uh, just important to note that uh, the T3 to the T8 section of the spinal cord is poorly supplied. It's only supplied by one single radicular medullary artery, which is why it's very easy to have watershed impacts in this region. So if you're looking, if you're thinking of a uh, vascular lesion, most likely, if it's an ischemic lesion, it's going to be presenting in the middle of uh, the upper thoracic region. The uh, rest of the uh, spinal cord is quite richly supplied, and uh, everybody knows about the artery of Adamthivich, which is the most uh, important artery, which is the feeder of the spinal cord arising on the left side at T9 to T12 level. Okay, so uh, that finishes up the first section. Uh, coming to the second section of the talk, the symptomatology of spinal disorders. So uh, when it comes to spine disorders, the most, uh, there are basically only two uh, areas of symptoms that you can have. You can have pain and you can have neurological involvement. Okay, so we'll discuss a little bit about pain. Uh, so when it comes to pain, the questions you should be asking to a patient are, is the pain axial or is it located more laterally? What is the exact location of the pain? Is it uh, in relation to the spinal column? Is it in relation to the paravertebral musculature? Is it in relation to the uh, gluteal region? Is it in relation to the legs? Is the pain radiating from its area of origin? And if, the if there is radiation, is it dermatomal? Is it going along a particular dermatome or not? Okay, so in uh, so it is very important to differentiate when a pain radiates. Is it radiating just to the buttocks, or is it going beyond the buttocks and involving the posterior thigh, involving the calf, involving the sole of the foot? All of that is very important to ask. 
the second thing is is the uh, in some cases if you are worried then uh, is the pain arising from a disc or is the pain arising from canal stenosis so discogenic pain the main problem the main reason why discogenic pain arises is because of compression of the disc okay so uh, that uh, that happens mostly when you are sitting when you are standing the disc does not get compressed okay so discogenic pain will be worst when you are sitting stenotic pain on the other hand will worsen when you are upright and the reason for that is because of venous congestion when you are standing upright by this canal stenosis uh, there will be venous congestion and uh, pain will worsen and this pain will improve when you bend forwards so that is a very classic history of neurogenic claudication that when they are standing for prolonged periods they have uh, worsening of pain and when they bend forwards the pain improves the other thing you want to ask is is the pain mechanical how do we identify that the pain is mechanical first of all the pain should happen specifically with movement and also with spinal loading so for example uh, if the patient gets up from a sitting position or the patient is bending forwards uh, so that loads the spine and you are developing pain that is mechanical pain and the another important characteristic is when you deload the spine the pain should stop that is mechanical pain no there is no other defining features of mechanical pain so th if you have these features then only can you call it mechanical pain the other important questions you want to ask when it comes to pain is is there any nocturnal worsening so if the pain worsens when the patient is lying down or when the patient is sleeping that indicates it could be two different conditions it could either be infection or inflammation or it could be neoplasm okay so uh, most of those conditions could be considered when there is nocturnal worsening and uh, like we uh, discussed does it improve the bending forward so all these questions you should ask whenever a patient comes to you with spinal pain uh mechanical pain can happen either from spinal causes or even importantly you have to remember from non spinal causes the important spinal causes for mechanical pain are it can happen from muscle and ligament strain it does not it does not always mean instability okay it can happen from muscle problem ligament problem it can happen from lysthesis that is instability it can happen from spondylolysis as well as from deformity okay most important of causes obviously instability but there are other causes also there are also multiple non spinal causes when it comes to mechanical pain that uh, could involve multiple joint dysfunctions hip problems muscle problems rotator cuff problems piriformis syndrome so you have to rule these out before you uh, before you can clearly say that this is a mechanical pain uh the second type of pain that is a uh, lot more important actually is the radicular pain so uh, radicular pain as we discussed is a type of uh, burning or shooting pain that travels along a particular dermatome it has to go along a particular dermatome to be called a radicular pain okay if it does not go along a dermatome it's not a radicular pain okay that is the first thing you have to figure out if you are discussing radicular pain the causes for radicular pain could be uh cause this uh, canal stenosis so in cervical canal stenosis uh, if you have just central canal stenosis you can get both myelopathy as well as radicular pain depending on what is involved the spinal cord or on the nerve root in lumbar central canal stenosis it is a proper canal stenosis you will get neuro neurogenic claudication you will not likely get radicular pain but when it comes to lateral canal and foraminal stenosis that's when you can get radicular pain and radiculopathy the important other differential diagnosis for radicular pain that is pain located not in the spine but going elsewhere you have to rule out other uh, peripheral uh, nerve entrapments like uh, median and ulnar nerve entrapment carpal tunnel syndrome uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome sometimes shoulder pain knee pain and uh, uh, hip pain as well Uh, another important thing when it comes to uh, discussing uh, uh, canal stenosis is how do we differentiate neurogenic versus vascular claudication? There's only a few important points, and it's very simple. Basically, neurogenic claudication, the pain will be located in the thigh and the buttocks, and in the vascular claudication, it will be located in the calf. The second thing is that uh, neurogenic claudication will worsen when the patient is standing, okay, and when they extend their back. That will have no effect in vascular claudication. The uh, patient when they lean forward. they will get relief in neurogenic claudication but in vascular claudication they have to stop whatever activity has caused the pain there's no role of position over here the time for relief is very different between both in neurogenic claudication they will take 5 to 15 minutes to get relief and they will get relief within 15 to 16 seconds in vascular claudication the other type of pain that you can get is very acute or localized pain and that can happen in very specific conditions only so it will be very easy for you to diagnose these conditions that is uh, trauma uh, pathologic fracture vascular events there is something called idiopathic vexal uh, brachial plexus uh, involvement called uh, parsonage turner syndrome as well as some uh, tumors where you have tumors with bleed so you can also develop acute localized pain 
Okay, so that is about pain and how we should describe pain and evaluate pain and see what specific type of pain it is to be able to figure out what is the generator of that pain and treat the patient. The second thing that you can develop, as, by, as I told you, was neurogenic or, neuro or neurological involvement. So that could either be motor symptomatology or sensory symptomatology. The motor symptoms can either be element involvement, which can happen from in the spinal, uh, in the vertebral column, from nerve root involvement or involvement of the anterior horn cells. So in lower motor neuron involvement, the patient will have more signs than they will have symptoms. Okay, they will they will present with weakness, but that will be a little bit more late. And when you in a lot more, they'll have clear cut atrophy, they'll have fasciculations. It'll be a lot more obvious. When it comes to UM and weakness on the other hand, the symptoms will be a lot more than signs. So here the patient will complain of tightness of limbs, they'll complain of clumsiness, they'll complain of difficulty walking, they're not able to walk fast, they're not able to uh, climb stairs quickly. Uh, another important characteristic to define a uh, UMN type of weakness or corticospinal tract involvement is that the weakness is maximal in groups which are not uh, not having a high tone. And it is important to understand that corticospinal tract involvement, when, it, uh, when the corticospinal tract is damaged, it causes the tone to increase in the upper limb flexors and in the lower limb extensors. Okay, So it is the opposite of those muscles which will be weak. So your upper limb extensors will be weak and your lower limb flexors will be weak. Okay, so if you have a characteristic of that type of weakness, you can say clearly that it is an upper motor neuron type of weakness. When it comes to upper motor neuron involvement, the first thing you will see is reflex changes that uh, follow that will then be followed by tone changes and then that will be followed by weakness. <clears throat> uh, sensory symptomatology, on the other hand, can happen from involvement of three different structures. That is root, dorsal column pathway, and spinothalamic pathway damage. So uh, so whenever you're evaluating sensory symptoms, you have to figure out exactly which pathway is involved. So if it's root damage, the patient will clearly complain of radicular pain. And uh, if it's dorsal column pathway damage, they will have fine tingling paresthesia and band-like sensations. When it comes to spinothalamic pathway damage, they'll have deep and poorly localized aching and burning type of pain. Okay. Another important thing to remember is that sensory symptoms, uh, if, are, if there are no sensory symptoms, you're unlikely to find sensory signs. Only if a patient complains of sensory symptoms, most likely you're going to find sensory signs. So uh, just a little bit of exactly what structure will give rise to what symptomatology. If a nerve root is involved, you'll get radicular pain, you'll get paresthesia in the area of the nerve root supply, and you'll get the weakness of the particular myotone that nerve root is supplying. If you have involvement of anterior horn, you will get element type of weakness, but a lot more important that, than that is wasting of muscles and fasciculations. That is very important. Then uh, involvement of the corticospinal tract will lead to stiffness of limbs and weakness of distal muscles particularly, and as we described, weakness of upper limb extensors and lower limb flexors. Involvement of the dorsal column, will, or when it comes to just symptoms, it will only cause ataxia, predominantly in the dark, and tingling, vibrating type of paresthesias. Spinothalamic tract involvement will cause a deep, poorly localized burning pain. Also, obviously, it can cause sensory loss when it comes uh, specifically uh, to pain and temperature. Uh, involvement of descending autonomic fibers, depending on where they're involved, can cause Horner syndrome, urinary urgency, frequency, incontinence, and also skin and trophic changes. Involvement of sacral parasympathetic center, on the other hand, will cause element type of bladder. You have urinary retention, you have constipation, sexual dysfunction. So, with this, uh, you can, with the symptoms, you're able to localize exactly what structures are involved based on just the symptoms. This is only on the history. Okay, so that is uh, the second section. Coming to the third section now, which is the how to examine a patient for spinal diseases. So this is a slightly long section. Uh, just uh, So what we'll do is basically just uh, go through it. This document will be available to all of you afterwards. So you don't have to try to mug up anything here. The basic idea is just understand the basics of how this examination is done. I'm sorry to say, but we are not including local examination of the spine, examination for nerve root compression, and examination of gait in this particular uh, session because it has got it will just become too long. So we'll try to cover it in some other session. So when it comes to examination of the motor system, we'll just uh, talk about just the motor system, the sensory system, and reflexes. How to do this examination? And uh, another thing is, if everybody is willing, we'll uh, also have a practical session at another date uh, with the patient as to how to do this examination as well. So coming to examination of motor systems, the first thing we have to describe is muscle volume and muscle contour. So that is described by inspecting, palpating, and measuring. Just look at the extremities and uh, compare both the sides. When you're looking at the extremities, what you should do is ask the patient to raise both their arms 
and keep them side by side and look along the long axis. Look from the fingers up to the shoulders. That is the best way to look for asymmetry on both sides. Uh, the same thing for like just look along the long axis and you'll be able to pick up a little bit of uh, asymmetry. Obviously not subtle asymmetry, but uh, obvious asymmetry for sure. The second thing is you should palpate the contour and the consistency. If it is firm, it's most likely a UMN type of involvement. If it's, if it's flabby, it's most likely an element type of involvement. And you should measure. There's no fixed points anywhere as to where you should measure uh, the muscle mass on both sides. Wherever you are measuring, just measure on the same at uh, the same distance from a fixed bony point. For example, if you choose the uh, elbow, you have to measure, for example, at 10 centimeter from the elbow on both sides. When it comes to tone, uh, tone <clears throat> is not as simple as just picking up the limb and moving it around. Okay, so tone. Uh, the uh, first thing we should do is just uh, take the limb, move it passively, and move it slowly through the complete range of motion. Following by uh, following that, then move it at various different speeds. The reason for this is spasticity is a velocity dependent phenomenon. The faster you move the limb, the more the spasticity you will be able to generate. So first, just look at uh, the limb movement passively and slowly, and then move it at different speeds. Okay, so hypertonia can happen uh, because of three reasons. Either can, there can be spasticity, or rigidity, or paratonia. Spasticity is a velocity-dependent phenomenon. Another, another important phenomenon which can develop with spasticity is clasp knife. So clasp knife is where you, uh, whenever you try to move a limb, initially it will be stuck. And then suddenly it will give way, and you'll be able to move the rest of the uh, distance <clears throat> of that range of movement. So uh, what you should do to, gen uh, to be able to elucidate clasp knife phenomenon is just, uh, for example, if you're elic uh, eliciting at the level of the knee, just uh, slightly fold the knee, just flex it, okay, hold it up, and then with a jerk, just uh, bend the knee. So that jerk movement is required, otherwise you'll not be able to elicit the clasp knife phenomenon. It should not be done slowly. Other important tests you can do to figure out the tone of the patient is uh, these uh, other tests, the Babinski tonus test, where you ask the patient to basically just abduct their arms and flex their elbows. So a patient who has spasticity is going to be able to flex their elbow only to an obtuse angle. They'll not be able to flex to an acute angle. A patient who ha who is flaccid will be able to flex to a hyperacute angle. Okay. The second thing you can do is just put your hand under the patient's uh, head and use the other hand to lift up the head and after some time just let it fall. The a normal head will fall rapidly, but if the patient has rigidity, the head will fall slowly. Other things you can do is uh, you can vigorously shake the shoulders of the patient and notice how much the uh, arm is moving on both sides. Uh, another important thing you can do is just raise the arm or the leg and drop it and see how fast it drops down. So uh, we all of us know how uh, the tone is scored, so I'm just not be going through the MAS score. <clears throat> so when it comes to evaluation of strength, an important principle that I don't think any of us know is the length strength principle. The basic idea is that the muscle is going to be weakest in the longest, in its lengthened position. For example, if you're looking at the biceps, when the elbow is extended, that is when the biceps is weakest. When the elbow is flexed, that is when the biceps is strongest uh, at, its, uh, at, at that position. So uh, and the important uh, idea when you're testing strength is the length strength principle, which says that anti-gravity muscles are going to be stronger than uh, the opposite muscles. So when you're testing the anti-gravity muscles, you have to test them in the length and position. And when you're testing the opposite muscles, uh, which work against the anti-gravity muscles, you have to test them in the shortened position. So your, uh, by, uh, your biceps muscle is an elbow flexor. So that is the opposite of an anti-gravity muscle. So that uh, has to be uh, tested in the shortened position. So when you're testing this patient's bicep, you make them flex the elbow first, and then you try to pull or try to extend the elbow. Okay, so that will work better than you trying than you telling them to fully extend the arm and then try to flex against resistance. Okay, so this it's an important principle, and we don't really use it, but uh, it works because uh, the difference between your flexors and extensors, and which is particularly exaggerated, but you have corticospinal tract involvement. So you have to uh, advantage the muscles which work against the anti-gravity muscles and disadvantage the anti-gravity muscles to be able to properly elucidate whether there's weakness. So what are the anti-gravity muscles in the neck? Extensors are obviously anti-gravity muscles. In the shoulder, adduction and extension is anti-gravity. In elbow, extension is anti-gravity. In wrist, flexion is anti-gravity. And in fingers, again, flexion is anti-gravity. So that can be a little bit difficult to understand. Basic idea is just look at this diagram. Okay, so you have to imagine a quadruped. Okay, so <clears throat> all the muscles which are keeping him in this position, which is A, these are anti-gravity muscles. Okay, so your elbow extensors, 
right your shoulder adductors your shoulder uh, uh flexors then your uh, hip uh, extensors your knee extensors the other thing is in position b when the patient try when he is trying to jump off from the ground all the muscles which are helping with that those are also anti gravity muscles okay so that is where you can see your wrist flexion and your finger flexion becomes an anti gravity muscle same thing with your plantar flexion and toe flexion so that is how you can remember which are the anti gravity muscles <clears throat> so uh, when it uh, so we can also evaluate uh, apart from the limb muscles the abdomen and the back extensors abdomen can be varied by the beaver spine when the patient is lying completely supine you ask them to hold their limbs uh, both their upper limbs to the side or on their chest okay and ask them to get up they should be doing it without taking support of uh, their body or the bed and you have to see where the umbilicus is moving if the umbilicus is moving up there's weakness of the upper abdominal muscles if it's moving down there's weakness of the lower abdominal muscles uh you can also evaluate back extensors uh by asking the patient to lie prone and then just lift up both their head and the legs and rock on their stomach or to stand and uh, bend forwards and try to get up from the bend, uh, from that uh, bending forwards position <clears throat> when it comes to lower limbs your extension and adduction are anti gravity knee extension is anti gravity and as we discussed in ankle and toes flexion plantar flexion is anti gravity okay how do we evaluate for subtle weakness uh, the most commonly known sign is obviously the pronator drift which is also known as a barre sign so what you do for this uh, particular sign is you uh, ask the patient to stand ask them to outstretch both their arms and these should be supinated and they should be at the same level then you ask them to close their eyes observe for at least 20 to 30 seconds if there is cortico spinal tract weakness the arm will pronate and the slightly flex at the elbow if it is a much more obvious weakness the entire elbow will flex and even the wrist will flex the standard position of cortico spinal tract weakness you can also evaluate uh, you can also see some other drifts with uh, pronation drift you can sometimes see a cerebellar drift and a parietal drift in cerebellar drift and parietal drift there be no pronation in cerebellar drift it will move upward and outward and in parietal drift it will move upward <clears throat> the other ways to evaluate subtle weakness are the digiti quanti sign which uh, when you're checking for the pronator uh, drift when they are uh, having their hands outstretched the a uh, little finger will be abducted on the side with weakness okay so that is called the digiti quanti sign we can also do the forearm and the finger roll and you can, and rapid alternating movements are also a test to evaluate for subtle weakness coming to examination of the sensory system so this uh this is just the most subjective part of examination so uh, this is the least reliable part of examination and i should not get frustrated whenever you're doing this examination it is very likely you will but this is the least important part of examination that is important to remember but if you do find a positive finding on sensory examination that is that has a very good localizing okay so uh, how to evaluate pain the different materials that are recommended for use are a broken wooden applicator a safety pin or a blunted hypodermic needle you should not use the wartenberg wheel or a uh, pain sensation you should ask the patient to close their eyes and compare both side to side and distal to proximal and move from an area of normal sensation first to the abnormal sensation and define what is the area of abnormal sensation <clears throat> when it comes to temperature what has been defined in dijon is cold at 5 to 10 degrees which is uh, which is pretty much debated everywhere so uh, uh, other basic idea is 7 degrees lesser than body temperature and 7 degrees more than body temperature a uh, tuning fork also can be used for cold and uh, you can use both glass as well as copper tubes for testing the temperature uh, usually uh, pain and temperature involvement will be same sometimes it can be slightly different and in temperature involvement usually cold and warm will be similar but if it is different heat impairment may be more more involved than cold impairment when it comes to touch on the other hand the materials you can use to touch uh use test touch are a wisp of cotton <clears throat> a feather soft brush light stroke of hair or a very light touch of fingertip uh a very important thing to remember is that gross touch will never be lost until the entire spinal cord is gone okay so uh just uh, it's a very simple to understand concept how this happens is if you gross touch is carried by both dorsal column and by spinal column tract if you look at the right side uh of the spinal cord it is going to be carrying the right side dorsal column fibers carrying the right side of the touch as well as the left side spinal column tract fibers so carry the left side of the touch so if even if you cut the right side the other side of the cord will also be carrying right side fibers so unless the entire cord is gone you cannot lose gross touch it is not possible 
because both sides are carrying both sides uh, gross touch. Uh, the uh, other two important modalities to examine are joint position sense and vibration. And joint position sense is where most of us end up making a mistake. So the idea is that uh, for most important, you start with the uh, metatarsophalangeal joint in the lower, lower limb, of, that is in the greater toe, and one of the distal interphalangeal joints in the upper limbs. And what you must do is, uh, whenever you are testing, first you show the patient what you are going to do. Okay, they should keep their eyes open. They should understand what you are going to do. So uh, the most important thing is, please hold the uh, finger or the toe on the sides at the joint you can hold it there okay and when you're flicking the finger up and down do not flick it from above and below flick it from the sides only you have to hold it and flick it up and down from below uh, from uh, the sides only so when you are starting first show your patient what you're doing you have to show them that this is up this is down they should understand and then only you should do it okay and you have to test this movement at least four times if you get it correct at least 50 percent of times joint position sense is normal it has to be less than 50% of times to say the joint position sense is abnormal. The most sensitive digit to test joint position sense is the fourth digit. The other things you can do is something called a parietal copy, where basically, uh, for example, you ask them to close your, eye, uh, close your eyes, you uh, alter their right hand and uh, make uh, make them point one finger or, or two fingers or whatever you want to do with their hand. And when their eyes close, they have to copy the same gesture you've created with the right hand to the left hand. The same thing you can do with the limbs also. You can just lift up the limb to a certain angle and ask them to lift up the other limb to the same angle as well. So that is called parietal copy, also used to test uh, joint position sense in the more proximal joints. <clears throat> now, vibration is actually the least useful sensory modality to test. It is carried by multiple tracts. It is definitely not localized only to the uh, dorsal column. It's carried by multiple tracts. But it can be useful to diagnose neuropathy or very severe dorsal column involvement. Okay, uh, so the way to do it is with uh, 128 hertz tuning fork. It is tested that the patient no longer feels vibration side to side. Both sides have to be compared and distal to proximal. The, uh, to say it is abnormal, there should be at least an asymmetry of 3 to 5 seconds between both sides. Coming to examination of uh, reflex, which is actually the most difficult part and where we make the most amount of mistakes. <clears throat> so come first the deep reflexes. The uh, muscle should first of all be kept halfway between full extension and full flexion. If you do not get a reflex on the first try, the first thing you should do is strike a harder blow. The second thing is alter the tension of the muscle. All of it depends on how uh, responsive your Golgi tendon organs and your uh, muscle spindles are. Right. So if you make the muscle slightly more taut, it is possible you'll be able to get a reflex. The third thing you can obviously do is the reinforcement maneuver. That is a gymnastic maneuver where you ask them to clench both their hands together and uh, pull against each other. As well as you can ask them to clench their teeth. Uh, when it comes to examination of the different reflexes, so this table is available for everyone to read afterwards. We'll just look at how it is done picture-wise. So this can be done when both the patient is sitting as well as lying down. So uh, when the patient is sitting, the biceps uh, reflex is actually with the, with the arm in a mid-prone position. Okay, so it should be mid-prone, mid-flexed. Okay, and um, you have to palpate the biceps tendon and strike against it. I'm not going to be describing how you use a knee hammer and how you strike. I'm hoping that everybody knows how that works. <clears throat> the same thing can be done with the patient uh, with, with the triceps reflex. Again, the arm should be in the mid-prone and uh, mid-flex position and you strike the triceps uh, uh, tendon. When it comes to the supinator reflex, uh, it is important to know that when the arm is going to be mid-prone and mid-flexed, if you tap the super, the uh, supinator, it will actually cause flexion and there will be no supination. But if you do it when the arm is fully extended and it is pronated, there will only be supination. It will not cause any flexion. That is why you can think maybe, okay, this is uh, reflex is absent, but it depends on what is your level of supination and uh, flexion when you're testing this. Another important thing is the inverted uh, supinator reflex. That is when the afferent limb of the reflex is impaired and because of which the uh, downstream pathways of the reflexes are exaggerated. So because of which you can get twitching or flexes of the hands or finger instead of the flexion and supination you're supposed to be seeing with a supinator reflex. <clears throat> uh, other important reflexes are the finger flexor reflex, also known as the Wartenberg sign. To do the finger flexor reflex, you have to place the hand on a surface and ask and uh, create a mild flexion of the fingers. Put two fingers on top of the uh, patient's fingers and then tap your fingers. Okay, so here we can see how the uh, the finger flex or reflex is done. Another important pectoral, uh, another important reflex is the pectoralis reflex. For this, you stand behind the patient, insert your index finger into the clavipectoral groove over here, 
and feel the pectoralis tendon and then tap it. Okay, the most important feature of the uh, uh, pectoralis jerk is if it is present, it directly localizes your disease to above C5. Okay. The other important reflexes uh, which we usually make mistakes in doing are the patellar reflex and the Achilles reflex. It is important to note that both of these can be done with the patient sitting also and supine also. So if the patient is sitting on a chair, you ask them to partially extend their knee. So just, they just have to put their knee out forward in a way that just their heel touches the floor. Okay, so it should not be lying fully flat. Just their heel should be touching the floor when they're sitting on the chair. If they're sitting on the examination table, the leg should be fully dangling. And if they're lying supine, you have to insert your hand below their uh, uh, leg, uh, slightly elevate the leg to cause partial knee flexion and strike the patellar tendon. The standard things for reflexes apply. You have to expose the muscle. The muscle contraction is more important than the movement of the limb. Right? So all of that is important. Uh, if a patellar reflex is exaggerated, you can even uh, elicit it by tapping just above the patellar tendon as well. <clears throat> uh, the Achilles reflex can also be elicited with the patient lying supine or the patient sitting. The same thing can be done as we do when the patient is lying supine. We make a figure of four with our leg. So the same thing can be done when the patient is sitting also. You just ask him to create a figure of four, flex the ankle to 90 degree and strike the Achilles tendon. Okay, so this is how we can test the patellar reflex in both the sitting and the lying position as well as the uh, Achilles tendon. This uh, second position is when the patient is kneeling on the bed. So when they're kneeling on the bed, their uh, feet should be dangling off the bed and you can strike the uh, Achilles tendon after flexing to 90 degrees. Coming to reflexes which are normally not present, also known as pathology reflexes. Uh, the grasp reflex is when you stimulate the skin on the palmar surface of the hand and they grasp your uh, um, a finger. So, <clears throat> so this most of these reflexes are really not useful for localizing purposes. They can reflect either pyramidal tract disease or frontal lobe disease. The other reflexes which are similar to frontal release reflexes are the palmomental reflex. You stroke the thena remnants and they will have wriggling of the skin of chin and retraction of the angle of mouth because of uh, involvement of the mentalis muscle. And this as I told, they have poor localizing values. The important reflexes when it comes to spinal disease, on the other hand, the Hoffman and the Tromner reflex. The Hoffman reflex and the Tromner reflex require special positions to be eliciting them properly. So what you should do is you should take the patient's hand and partially dorsiflex the hand, just partially, not as much as you're going to be dorsiflexing in the Tromner sign. Okay, so partially dorsiflex the hand and partially dorsiflex the middle finger as well. Then use your uh, middle finger to support the patient's middle finger and then just flick the uh, distal phalanx. That's all. Okay, so when the most, the only thing you have to look for in the Hoffman sign is flexion of the thumb. Nothing else. The flexion of the thumb has to be there. Okay. The second thing is a Tromner sign, which is this, just the same idea. It will also cause uh, flexion of the finger uh, flexors, sorry, uh, stretch of the finger flexors, again causing the same uh, flexion of the fingers. So in this, what you have to do is you have to slightly dorsiflex more, okay, lift up the middle finger even more, okay, and then while you're lifting up with one hand, you have to tap the uh, part of the uh, terminal phalanx on this hand. So again, it will cause flexion of the fingers. The other pathologic reflexes uh, I'm not really going to discuss are the snout sucking and the rooting reflexes. Again, similar to uh, all your frontal release signs. Uh, how to how do we examine for Cronus? So another area of commonly where mistakes are made. Uh, for examine, uh, it's actually a very very simple examination. For examination of ankle Cronus, it is similar to examining the patellar reflex. Just flex the knee, okay, and after that hold with your fingers on the sole of the foot, okay, and you have to do two maneuvers. You have to dorsiflex and you have to avert. Both maneuvers have to be done, dorsiflexion and eversion. And after you have done that, you have to hold that position. You should not leave it. The second you leave it, the clonus will stop. Okay, so hold that position. So uh, the, there are multiple different uh, definitions of ill-sustained and well-sustained clonus. Some say three, some say four, some say five. It does not matter. The basic idea of a well-sustained clonus is as long as you're holding the posture, if the clonus continues, it is a well-sustained clonus. If the clonus stops after a few beats, it's an ill-sustained clonus. For the patellar uh, clonus, on the other hand, the leg should be fully relaxed and fully straight. Okay. So here what you do is you take your thumb and your uh, index finger. You feel the superior aspect of the lateral part of the patella and just force it down. Okay. So this will stretch the patella tendon and the uh, patella tendon will keep pulling the patella up as long as you're pushing it down. Okay. <clears throat> when it comes to superficial reflexes, the most, most important reflex is the plantar reflex. 
and uh, we know this is the most difficult reflex to elicit when it comes to reflexes. So uh, some important points which can really help you elicit a reflex is, uh, first of all, you tell the patient what you're going to do. Okay, there, if you provide a painful stimulus to a patient, the response is obviously going to be withdrawn. They're going to pull their limb away from you. So you tell the patient there's going to be a slightly noxious stimulus and to just relax and it is not going to be incredibly uncomfortable for them. Just a slightly noxious stimulus and they should just relax. Uh, so you have to hold the leg fully extended. You should hold the ankle to stabilize the foot. The important thing is do not trace along the sole. Okay, it is not on the sole. It is on the lateral aspect of the sole. Okay, so just just where the uh, sole and the lateral border of the foot meet, that is where you have to trace. From the bottom of the sole up till the little toe. That is all. And the, the idea of a plantar reflex is both temporal and spatial summation. So you should do it slowly. If you do it fast, it is not going to work. Okay. So uh, that, it is the idea for all superficial reflexes, abdominal, cremastic, temporal, and spatial summation. You have to go a distance and you have to do it slowly. Okay. So, uh, uh, but it is most important for plantar reflex. So first you go along the uh, lower aspect of the sole up to the ball of the, uh, the uh, small toe. And then you see if the response is listed or not. The only response you're looking for is flexion of the great toe, nothing else. Fanning of the other toes, whatever else is happening does not matter. The first movement of the great toe is what is significant. Okay, so uh, after, if you're not able to elicit after tracing on up till the lesser toe, then you should trace along the ball of the foot. But you should never trace at the level of the toes. If you touch the toes, there is going to be a flexor response. Okay, so just along the ball of the foot. Okay, and that only when you're not able to trace on the lateral aspect of the foot. Sometimes when the reflex is exaggerated, you can get a triple flexion response. It's putting a dorsi flexion of the ankle also, a flexion of the knee, a flexion of the hip, and a flexion of the tensor facial lata that is separately known as a basalt reflex. These one, two, three, four, five, six other ways of uh, uh, doing the plantar reflex are the only actually important ways of doing it. There are about 15 to 20 different ways of doing the plantar reflex, but this is the only useful ones. The two most important ones are the Chardock and the Schaefer. Okay, so the Chardock is where you trace along the lateral side of the foot on the dorsal surface, not the plantar surface. Okay, and the Schaefer is where you uh, squeeze the Achilles tendon, Gordon is where you squeeze the calf muscles. Oppenheim is you trace along the shin. Bing is where you just uh, multiply, uh, multiple times you prick the dorsal lateral surface of the foot. And the only other different uh, weird one is Gonda, where you take the fourth toe, you pull it outwards and downwards for a brief time and then release it suddenly. Okay, so if you if you have to learn about what are the different other ways of doing it, these are the only six useful ways which you should learn about. So uh, this are, these are all uh, just physical, uh, sorry, uh, representative images. You can go through that later at any point of time. <clears throat> the other superficial reflexes are the abdominal reflex. And when it comes to the abdominal reflex, this is the way to do it. Okay, you have to come towards the umbilicus from all the different quadrants. You're not going from the umbilicus outside. You're coming from the different quadrants towards the umbilicus. Okay, and what you're going to see is just a flickering movement of the underlying abdominal muscles. That's all. Okay. Right. Uh, the other important reflex is the cremastic reflex, where you stroke the medial thigh towards the testicles. Uh, the anal wink reflex, where you can see anal sphincter contraction by multiple different ways. You can uh, prick or scratch the perianal skin. You can ask the patient to cough. You can stimulate the urethra, the bladder if you have a catheter or something. Or you can stimulate the glands of the clitoris. So that, that is all anal wink. The bulbocavernous reflex actually is not what we describe as a bulbocavernous reflex. It is where you uh, basically pinch the glands and you should feel the contraction of the bulbocavernous on the perineum. It is not the contraction of the anal sphincter because the anal sphincter is not made of the pulbocavernous muscle at all. So it is not the pulbocavernous reflex. So you have to put your fingers on the perineum and feel for the contraction of the pulbocavernous muscle. Okay, so that was the third section, the largest section we have. So, uh, okay, so next we'll go on to the fourth section uh, that is uh, localization of spinal disorders. So we have learned so far as to what is the anatomy of the spinal cord. We have understood how to examine and how to evaluate for symptoms. So we know that what are the different substrates which uh, will get involved when there are different symptoms and there are different uh, examination findings. So using these substrates, how can we localize exactly where our lesion is? So in the spine, that is where we face the most difficulty with localization. So I've tried to make it quite simple and uh, straightforward. 
right? So uh, we'll first discuss what to do with nerve roots, and then we will discuss what to do with the spinal cord. So uh, nerve root syndromes are usually are going to be limited to these nerve roots. It's very unlikely you'll be going beyond these nerve roots. So uh, with these nerve roots, there are very specific areas where you'll get findings. So three important findings are pain, motor finding, and reflex changes. So with C5, you will have pain or radicular. This is radicular pain. Okay, no other type of pain. It should be going to the neck and the shoulder. Okay, the uh, weakness will involve shoulder abduction as well as elbow flexion. Elbow flexion is subtired by C5 also. Okay, and the reflexes will be biceps and breaker radialis. C6 almost similar. Okay, now because of C6 involvement, pain will also go along the lateral aspect of the forearm and involve the uh, dorsal forearm as well. Uh, there will also, uh, apart from involvement of uh, elbow flexion, there will also be difficulty with wrist extension. Wrist extension is also C6. Okay, and also involvement of biceps and brachioradialis. Uh, the third thing is the C7 uh, nerve root. That is, uh, the pain now will start going along your dorsal forearm. Uh, it is very important to remember that when it comes to radicular pain, it usually does not extend to the hands and the feet. That is why they have paresthesia. Okay, but radicular pain does not go to hands and does not go to feet. Okay, so it will not extend up up till that period usually. Okay, so uh, in C7 you're usually going to get involved with the dorsal forearm. In C8 you usually get involved with the medial forearm. Very unlikely to get involvement of fingers and hands. Same thing with uh, your uh, lower limbs as well. So C7, uh, we obviously know it's elbow extension, but it's also wrist flexion. And triceps will obviously be lost. In C8, on the other hand, that is uh, the involvement of the medial forearm for a radicular pain, in involvement of intrinsic hand muscles, and loss of the finger flexor reflex. <clears throat> The important thing when it comes to differentiating L4, L5, and S1 radicular pain, all of them will go start from the lower back, will go to the buttock, and then from where they go from there, that is what defines whether it is L4, L5, or S1. The L4 uh, radicular pain will go along the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh and go to the anterior aspect of the leg. Okay. The L5, on the other hand, will go slightly more behind. It will go to the lateral thigh and it will go to the anterior lateral calf. S1, on the other hand, will clearly go to the calf. Okay, so these highlighted areas is where you have to look for to define this is L4, L5, or S1 radicular pain. The motor findings, uh, according, this is according to Brazos, uh, L4 is supposed to be a difficulty with knee extension. But as what is usually described is L3. So it's, this is a very debatable topic. Uh, the other thing they have mentioned is L5 for dorsiflexion of foot and toes. Dorsiflexion of foot is usually taken as L4. Dorsiflexion of the great toe is taken as L5. You standardly. If you have to quote Brazos, then you have to quote L4 for knee extension and L5 for dorsiflexion of foot and toes. S1 is very clearly plantar flexion, there's no doubt there. L4 involvement, is a, L3 and L4 involvement causes involvement of the patellar reflex and S1 involvement causes the involvement of the Achilles tendon reflex. These are the important dermatomes and uh, myotomes. Uh, so uh, the dermatomes, I think all of us know quite well by now. The important uh, area where we get confused are what are the myotomes. As we saw, Brazos itself had some confusing ideas as to where the myotomes are. So when you're describing myotomes, just take the 10 key muscles that are described by the EGS score. Okay, these, are the, these are the muscles, oh, sorry, not the muscles, the uh, joint movements which have been uh, described for a single level of the spinal cord. Okay, so, they, uh, so when a single level is involved, you can localize to that level with only these 10 key muscles. In the upper limb, the elbow flexor, that's where we start, that is C5. The wrist extensors is C6. The elbow extensors are C7. The finger flexors are C8. And the finger abductors are T1. Okay, the same, in lower limbs, it's a lot more easy. Hip flexors are L2, knee extensors are L3, ankle dorsal flexors are L4, long toe extensors are L5, and ankle plantar flexors are S1. The only confusing thing is upper limb, so you should spend a little bit more time to understand what the key muscles are in the motor region there. The other important thing is uh, when it comes to nerve root involvement, when you have nerve root involvement, where, how do you know which level it is involved in? So to figure that out, we have to understand that there are three basic uh, disc uh, diseases which you can get. The disc can either be uh, protruding in the center of the canal, causing uh, central canal stenosis, or it can come out in the lateral aspect of the canal, or it can come out very far lateral in the neural foramen. Okay, so the important thing is when it comes to lumbar region, you have a lateral uh, canal. In the cervical region, we do not have enough space, so there's no lateral canal. 
Okay, so in the cervical region, your most common disc is a far lateral disc. In your lumbar region, the most common disc is a posterior lateral disc. So when it comes to, uh, for example, if you're looking at the L4, L5 region, the L4, L5 region, if there is a posterior lateral disc protrusion, if you look at B over here, the nerve root which is going to be involved is the nerve root which is traversing through that region. That is the L5 nerve root. On the other hand, if you ended up having a far lateral disc at the neural foramina, you're going to involve the exiting root. Okay, so that it is very clear in the lumbar region. So uh, the where this uh, idea comes from is that whichever nerve root is exiting, it is going to exit below its level of vertebra. The L5 nerve root will exit below the L5 vertebra. But when it comes to cervical level uh, nerve roots, they're going to be exiting above the level of the vertebra. So C5 will be exiting above the C5 vertebra. But we know that the most common disc in a cervical vertebra is the far lateral disc. So the exiting nerve root is going to be involved. So even in cervical and even in lumbar regions, the disc uh, or the nerve root which is involved by a particular level disc is going to be the lower level of C4, C5, C5 nerve root. L4, L5, L5 nerve root. That is always under the assumption that in cervical it is a far lateral disc. In uh, lumbar region, it is a posterior lateral disc. If that is not true, then you have to use your brain, obviously. How do we localize cord disease? Uh, so these are the most important valuable points for localizing cord disease. Uh, as we discussed, sensory disturbances are very difficult. Okay, So the most valuable for localization is pain, the pinprick sensation. Okay, And also localized vertebral pain, if it is present, it's very obvious key. this disease is here. Okay. The most important of, uh, uh, thing to localize uh, cord disease is motor disturbances, particularly element signs. Okay. The other uh, way, other things you can use to localize are autonomic disturbances, bladder and bowel. Bladder and bowel usually gets involved only with bilateral involvement. Okay. Horner syndrome that will localize to some area of the cervical cord and autonomic dysreflexia. This usually happens after spinal cord injury. If it is above the level of T6, any noxious stimulus, which is below the level of T6, your bladder is full, you have uh, impacted T6, is going to uh, create basically a, a catecholaminergic storm leading to uh, tachycardia, but with hypotension because your spinal cord is not intact. Right, so that is autonomic dysreflexia. And if it is present, your lesion is above the level of T6. The other things uh, you can use particularly to localize high cervical lesions. Okay, so these five uh, features are the only ways you can localize lesions between C1 to C5. There's no other way. Okay, So one is the onion peel facial, uh, facial sensory loss. That is involvement of the fifth nerve spinal uh, tract. Okay, which is extending up to C2, C3 only. Uh, diaphragmatic palsy, involvement of the phrenic nerve nucleus, C3 to C5. Spinal accessory nerve, extending from C2 to C5. C2 and C3 is going to be supplying sternocleidomastoid, and C4, C5 is going to be supplying the trapezius. Suboccipital muscle wasting, which could be involvement of C2, C3, or C4. And suboccipital paresthesia, or sensory loss, that will also tell you it's an involvement of the high cervical lesion. When it comes to localizing the most important thing that you have to consider is the reflex changes. So those are the most objective changes you'll find. Everything else is a little bit subjective. Element weakness is more subjective than reflex changes. And sensory changes are the most subjective. That is, you have to get the least importance there. So when it comes to localizing spinal cord disease, uh, we have discussed uh, as to what are the different substrates and what are the different levels you can get. Another important area where we can get confused are is the disease extradural, intradural, extramedullary, or intramedullary. So you have to understand there is some overlap. There is no clear-cut demarcation that it can be only this, this, this. So one of the best things to do when you're localizing a spinal cord disease is give options. Okay, it could be this, it could be this also. But these are the points in favor, these are the points against. So when you're looking at points in favor and against, this is the table. There's generally no more feature than this to define a spinal cord disease. So a radicular pain obviously is going to be present significantly in intradural and extramedullary lesions, but it can be present in the other two as well. Extradural, obviously, disc disease can cause radicular pain. Intramedullary, if it involves the dorsal root entry zone, can also cause radicular pain. Okay, But radicular pain is present, the first thing should be IDM. Vertebral pain is present, directly extradural disease, simple as that. Mechanical pain is present, extradural disease, unless it's an IDM which has caused instability. Okay, so that you have to think of that also. Uh, funicular pain is most likely going to be an extramedullary, uh, sorry, intramedullary uh, diseases. And then uh, UMN signs will be early in the diseases compressing from the outside because your corticospinal tracts are located towards the outside. Intramedullary lesions will cause it quite late.
Elemin signs, on the other hand, will be quite prominent in intramedullary diseases. Not just prominent, they will be diffuse. There will be so many multiple levels involved that will be very obvious as an intramedullary lesion. If it is happening in extramedullary lesions, it will be just segmental, limited to one or two or three segments. Paresthesias in uh, lesions located outside are going to be ascending. We know that spinothalamic tract is organized in a way that cervical is located towards the uh, medial side and sacral is located towards the lateral uh, side or the more external side of the cord. So when you are compressing from outside, you're going to be compressing the sacral fibers first. If you're compressing from inside, you're going to be compressing the cervical fibers first. So in intramedullary, you get sacral sparing. On the other hand, in extramedullary diseases, you will start from sacral region and you will ascend upwards. Sphincter abnormalities, you have to understand this concept very clearly. When we go and say there was an early bladder involvement, it says intramedullary, it is, it is nothing like that. If you have a cervical lesion, within, which is intramedullary, the bladder involvement is going to be very late. As we saw, the bladder fibers are lying where? They're lying outside the gray matter. So to get there, it takes time. And if you involve one side of the fibers, you're not going to get bladder involvement. So it has to involve both sides. The only place where you get early bladder involvement is in direct conus and caudal lesions. Okay, anywhere above that, there is no early bladder involvement. Okay, uh, symmetry is a little bit of a doubtful thing. Uh, extradural lesions usually are going to be symmetric. Intradural and extramedullary should be asymmetric. Intramedullary are supposedly symmetric, but mostly everywhere they have been described, it is asymmetric. Coming to comparing corda versus conus medullaris, it is similar to comparing uh, basically your cord involvement versus nerve root, run of root involvement. Your conus medullaris vertebral level will correspond to L1 and your corda will extend anywhere from L2 to S5. Conus usually is going to be involved in a sudden and bilateral manner. While corda usually is going to be slowly involved, all the nerve roots have to slowly, slowly get involved. It will be unilateral. The presentation in conus is usually symmetric because the conus is like a small area. So obviously the entire conus gets involved and it's symmetric. In corda, on the other hand, it's quite asymmetric. Lower extremity weakness is unlikely in conus because you are, it is only S2, S3, S4. All the lower extremity muscles are up to less one only. So your lower extremity does not get involved in conus lesions. It will, you will on the other hand, have lower extremity weakness in the uh, cauda equina because L1, L2, L3, L4, all those nerve roots get involved. Uh, sexual dysfunction will be common in conus medullaris, again, because S2 to S4 is involved. And cauda equina will be much later and rarer. Sphincter involvement, again, will be late and mild in, in cauda and early and severe in conus. In sensory loss, again, conus will involve S2 to S4. And cauda will involve also the cervical anesthesia, apart from that sensory loss over lower lips. <clears throat> Another important thing is how do we localize weakness? We, just because weakness is present does not mean it's spinal cord disease or nerve root disease. Weakness can arise from other structures as well. So how do we differentiate between all of those? In cervical cord, obviously you have weakness of both upper limbs and lower limbs. And your details will be brisk. You'll have autonomic dysfunction and sensory loss. Just if you come down, you'll just lose the arm weakness. That's all. So thoracic cord will have leg weakness, exaggerated reflexes, and all the similar things. If you come much lower down in cauda equina, as we saw, involvement... There can be involvement of both legs, but it will be usually asymmetric. Multiple nerve roots are involved. DTRs now will obviously become decreased. There is occasional autonomic dysfunction, pain, and sensory loss. On the other hand, when it comes to anterior horn cell, the clear things are there is no sensory involvement. It is a focal weakness of whatever area of the anterior horn cells are involved. And whenever there's anterior horn cell involvement, the reflex arc does not get disturbed. Okay, So you usually have a brisk reflex. Because the most common anterior horn cell disease is motor neuron disease, where you also, uh, sorry, no, not MND, I mean uh, ALS, the most common involvement will also, also include corticospinal tract involvement. So that is involved. So you're going to get brisk reflexes, usually. So if you're seeing element weakness with brisk reflexes, your first diagnosis should be motor neuron disease. Okay. Uh, but very clearly, the most amount of atrophy and fasciculations you will get are in the anterior horn cell. Nerve root, on the other hand, uh, will ha will affect just its myotome. L1 will affect L1 myotome, etc., etc. DTRs will be, again, decreased, and there will be pain and sensory loss, similar with neuropathy as well, just its area of distribution. That is important. On the other hand, when it comes to neuromuscular junction and muscle, both of these have proximal involvement of muscles. In neuromuscular junction involvement, the important thing is look for bulbar involvement and fatiguing of the weakness. In muscle involvement, there could be multiple different patterns depending on the different myopathy it is. But importantly, your NMJ and muscle involvement is proximal. Your polyneuropathy is more distal. <clears throat> then how, then finally, the most important thing when we come to uh, a discussion of localization and analysis, how do we analyze 
what is the different uh, possibilities for this patient. So you have to start with the most basic thing. What is the patient's age? Okay. So it's a pediatric patient, you will think of different things. An elderly patient, you will think of different things. So that depends on whatever your symptoms are. The second thing is how has the illness started? Is it sudden? Is it acute? Or is it chronic? If it is sudden, there are basically only two options. Trauma and vascular. Sometimes demyelination can also present absolutely suddenly. But usually it will be a little bit acute. It will slowly, slowly progress over a few days. Uh, the other acute uh, involvement could most likely would be infection, inflammation, or demyelination. Chronic could be degenerative diseases and maybe some neoplasms. Uh, the duration of the disease is also important. If, if it's only a short duration, you should think of infections, inflammations, and malignant neoplasms. Long durations, you have benign neoplasms and degenerative diseases. And whatever your symptoms are, you have to uh, obviously associate other uh, diseases along with that. So following that, you will get some idea as to what your disease possibly is. Following which, you have to see what are your substrates involved. First of all, are your substrates extra spinal or are they neurological? Uh, is the pain arising from involvement of bone, from the muscle, from ligaments or disc? It is important to recognize that it is not just uh, nerve roots or spinal cord which give rise to pain. If the patient has pain, you also have to think of these other possibilities. Uh, if, the neuro if there is neurological involvement, is it coming from a nerve root or is it coming from the spinal cord? If it is coming from the spinal cord, is it coming from the gray matter or from the white matter? <clears throat> if it is coming from the white matter, what are all the different types involved? So you have to go in this sequence to pick out what are the different substrates that are involved in your uh, spine localization. After you've picked out the substrates, you have to localize what are the different uh, uh, levels of involvement. So the level of disease is defined by what is the highest level of involvement on this. So when it comes to uh, history, you have to define both the mo motor and the sensory level of involvement. When it comes to uh, examination, you should also include the motor, sensory, and reflex involvement. Uh, you also have to define the vertical extent and the horizontal extent of the disease. The vertical extent is defined only by the element involvement. Whatever is the lower motor neuron involvement. If there is no lower motor neuron involvement, you should not be describing the vertical extent of disease. You can only tell the level. You can you can just say that I cannot define the vertical extent because there's no element involvement. Okay, so whatever is the area of element involvement, that is the vertical extent of disease. If all element, element also includes, for example, if you have C5, C6, C7, nerve root involvement, that is also extend level of disease also. Because okay, so that is also vertical level. But you cannot use uh, UMN weakness to define vertical extent of disease. Uh, apart from that, you also have to define what is the horizontal extent. So is it more, is it symmetric? Is it on both sides? Is it on one side more? Is it anterior? Is it posterior? Is it central? Okay, those are the only options for horizontal level of uh, uh, disease. Pain of lesion, we've already discussed how to differentiate between extradural, intradural, extramedullary, and intramedullary lesions. So you have to include all these when you're localizing lesion. Following which, finally, we'll come to our differential diagnosis. Uh, last section, which is uh, how do we formulate a differential diagnosis once we have uh, localized and uh, figured out exactly where our region is located. So this is a flowchart which has been described in humans as to formulating a differential diagnosis, particularly for spinal disease, is slightly complicated looking. So I've simplified a little bit. The two basic things you can have are pain and neurological deficit. Okay, so first you have to figure out if pain is there, what type of pain is it? Is the pain associated with fever or weight loss and it worsens when the patient lies down? Most likely it's an infection. The second thing is, is the pain worse when the patient is lying down and at night? Another possibility is it could be neoplasm. The pain is worse early morning and it is associated with stiffness. It's most likely an inflammatory disorder like rheumatoid arthritis. If there is mechanical pain, it could be, as we described, instability, deformity or muscular ligamentous strain. If it is an acute localized pain, we know there are only a few options. It could be trauma or a pathological fracture. When it comes to neurological deficits, we should know when and how the neurological deficit has happened. Okay, if it is an absolutely sudden onset, okay, there are only two options: it is trauma or it is vascular. Another possibility it could be demyelination. Another, uh, uh, the other thing is acute or subacute onset. Over a few days, it has developed. Most likely, it's infection or inflammation. And if it's chronic, it could be ischemia, some vascular malformations causing venous hypertension or a steel phenomena. It could be degenerative neuronal diseases like your ALS or uh, it could be degenerative spine diseases as well. Okay, so that is the uh, fifth section. So uh, coming to the practice question. So here, whoever is uh, present, 
uh, this is basically for you. So you have to participate. There will be a few questions we will ask. Very simple, very basic. Okay, just the idea of how to localize a disease. That's all. Okay, all of you, all of you know this already. It's very simple. Because this is the first question. So this patient has come with a history of it's a twenty-four year old male, weakness of the right hand since the last three years. It is gradually progressive, and there's hollowing of the right hand since the last three years, which is also gradually progressive. He has noticed thinning of the right forearm since the last two years, and now he has difficulty gripping object with his left hand since the last five months. Okay. So, what is the first thing you want to do? Okay. So, the first thing we want to ask is negative history. Like, what is missing? The most one most important thing you want to ask is if there's any. Sensory involvement. Okay. Then this patient has only mentioned that they have weakness associated with thinning, but they have not talked anything about fasciculation or tremulousness. So we don't know if it is involvement of either the anterior horn cell or some other area of the element pathway. Right. So this is another important negative history we want to ask. But the most important negative history is: is there sensory involvement or not in this patient? Okay. Then next. Or based on this, what are the different substrates involved? Right. So the substrates involved are most likely the anterior horn cells. Okay. Then where do we want to localize? We want to localize to the right C7 to T1 anterior horn cells and the left C8 to T1 anterior horn cells. The level, as we know, is the highest level involved. It is going to be C7, and vertical extent is all the involvement of the LMN pathway, whatever LMN features you have. So it is C7 to T1. Horizontal extent in this patient, we know right side is involved more than left side. It is right more than left. The plane of the lesion is where we can get slightly confused. So, what could it be? Okay, so you have involvement of only anterior horn cells. The way that only anterior horn cells can be involved, either it is an anterior horn cell disease, one, or second, anterior horn cells are the most metabolically active cells of the spinal cord. So, either it is a vascular uh, phenomenon which is causing Loss of uh, blood supply from the anterior horn cells. So that can happen from any lesion compressing the cord from outside, which is causing uh, compression of the veins or compression of the arteries. Because okay, so that can also cause it. So extradural direct compression will affect the sensory pathways also. But if you have indirect involvement by uh, compressing the veins or the arteries, you can just involve the anterior horn cells. So what is your what what are the different uh, differential diagnoses you can think of? Okay. So the usual differential diagnosis for a disease like this. Okay, so that so here I have uh, sort of given you an idea as to how to analyze and how to proceed with this sort of a picture. The next case is all yours. You have to figure out what to do. I will be reading this out, so just uh, listen carefully. A uh, 45-year-old female patient presented with a history of pain over the upper back. It is a burning type. She is unable to clearly describe the pain. The pain started insidiously three years ago and has progressed slowly. She then started noticing weakness of her right hand, followed by her left hand since the last one and a half years. This is associated with shaking of her hand and hollowing of the hand. She also complains of difficulty appreciating the sensation of warmth over both hands while cooking food and has developed multiple injuries over her hands from burns. She has no difficulty appreciating the sensation of touch over her hands. She is also able to feel the sensation of hot and cold water while bathing over the rest of the body. She has also noticed that she has urinary urgency since the last one and a half years and also has to get up frequently in the night to pass urine. If she is unable to reach the bathroom, she passes urine in her clothes itself, but she is able to sense that she has passed urine. What are the different substrates involved? Okay, so uh, corticospinal tract is human involvement. Okay, human involvement will have stiffness, increased tone, okay, and weakness of distal limbs. And weakness of particular groups of muscles. Element involvement will have wasting, fasciculations, tremulousness. Okay, so what is she describing here? I told you two areas where you can get element involvement. Yeah, okay, so this most likely is going to be anterior horn cell involvement. Okay, so anterior horn cells are involved. Uh, where are the anterior horn cells involved from what area to what area? Both. Okay, so hands are C8 and T1. Okay, so those are the myotomes of the hands. This is involved with the other substrates apart from a bilateral anterior horn cells at C8 T1 level. Okay, so this is the most common mistake we make. Okay, spinothalamic tract fibers cross at what level? 
two or three levels above. Okay. So if you are having sensory loss over the hands at C A T one level, where is your lesion? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So you at least at least have C six involvement, right? Okay. Okay. So the next thing is what are we? Yeah. Uh, infection will cause arachnoiditis. So, arachnoiditis, yeah, that can cause swelling. Okay, so on examination, the patient was found to have wasting of bilateral thenar and hypothenar eminence, bilateral hand grip weakness, bilateral biceps, triceps, supinator, and finger flexors were absent, bilateral triceps and knee jerk were exaggerated, bilateral plantars were upgoing, and abdominal reflexes were absent. So the bilateral sensory loss to pain and temperature in C7, C8, and T1 dermatome. And Romberg sign was negative, and gait was normal. Oh. So that is uh, knee jerk and ankle jerk. That is bilateral knee jerk and ankle jerk exercise. Okay, uh, I will anyway leave like a feedback uh, form and for anyone to ask any more questions later. If you want to ask, especially the people who are online, thank you very much for attending the talk. You will be logging off.